in the life of Elijah on Sunday mornings, and we've come to 1 Kings chapter 18, and this is our fifth message. We've had four messages already on the life of Elijah as we've talked about the series title, How God Uses Ordinary People. God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. He uses regular folks to accomplish miraculous and amazing things, and God wants to use you. He wants to work in your life. He wants to do amazing things through you. And only God can accomplish His will and purpose in and through your life. And so today we come to 1 Kings chapter 18. And I want you to know you serve an extraordinary God who can accomplish extraordinary things through ordinary people just like us. And today I want to think about this subject, high noon, high noon. Now many of you, when I say the subject, you remember There was a a Western film, maybe one of the best Western films in history. It was produced in 1952, and the movie's name was High Noon. And in 1952, it starred some of the box office giants of that day. There was a guy there named Gary Cooper, a lady named Grace Kelly, another guy named Ian McDonald. And, uh, I mean, it was just a, a hit. The story, the story is about one lone marshal, Marshal Will Cain comes up against an intimidating, rough, tough band of gunfighters. And the marshal was a man of principle. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of, of courage. And he, he meets all these gunfighters at high noon, a showdown right there at the town square. Well, fast forward, and you know how the movie ends, right? The good guy wins and the bad guys die. That's why it was such a great movie. You may want to check it out, High Noon from 1952. Well, right here in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see a showdown. It is High Noon. Here it is, the prophet Elijah before the prophets of Baal and prophets of Asherah. It's good versus evil, God versus Baal, Elijah versus 850 false prophets. The scene doesn't take place in a western town. It takes place in the land of Palestine on a mountain named Mount Carmel. I want to challenge you in your, in your free time as you study the Word of God. Study the mountains in Elijah's life. It's very interesting to notice the mountains in Elijah's life. Here he is on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. And then in 1 Kings 19, he is on Mount Horeb. And then in Mark chapter 9, the New Testament, he is on Mount Tabor. And so I, I'd encourage you to study the, the, the mountains in Elijah's life. You could, you could probably call Elijah a mountain man. I mean, he, everything that happened significant in his life happened on a mountaintop somewhere. And here in 1 Kings 18, if you've ever heard of mountaintop experiences, this is indeed a mountaintop experience in the life of Elijah. I want to remind you, we've been saying this for, for weeks now. It was there at Mount Carmel. God had been preparing Elijah for something big, for something significant, for something important. And it was a lot like that movie High Noon where everybody gathered around and everybody was watching. And you've got Jezebel and her her band of evil guys. And you've got Elijah, this lone prophet of the Lord. And the good guys win and the bad guys die here at the end of 1 Kings chapter 18. But I want to remind you what we've been saying for weeks about Elijah. What we've seen in the life of Elijah when he appears before Ahab and stares him down and says, No rain until I say so. What, what happened when he went to the brook Cherith as he was fed by ravens miraculously provided by that brook? What, what happened when he provided for the widow and her son miraculously through the work of God? Last week we saw that God used him to raise this widow's son back to life. But everything in Elijah's life, remember, is preparing him for this moment in 1 Kings 18. Everything was preparing him for Mount Carmel. God was taking him through different, you you want to call it, he was setting the paces through different circumstances and situations. And he was preparing Elijah for this moment on Mount Carmel. It is high noon. It is time for a showdown. It's Elijah versus the false prophets of God. And this reminds me of a very important theological statement. You need to get this this morning, okay? I want you to hear it. God is preparing you for what he's prepared you for. That makes a lot of sense, right? I want to say it again because this is deep, okay? God is preparing you for what he's prepared you for. In other words, he is getting you ready for what he intends for you to do. 
And you may look at circumstances and situations as an odd string of events or random chance or acts of, of, of chaos and confusion. You may look at your life and not see what God is doing. But I want you to know everything God allows you to encounter, everything he brings you through, every time he provides, every time he does a miracle, he's preparing you for something significant. God's preparing you for what he's prepared you for. He's got something significant for you to do and for you to accomplish. And now in and through your life, he is bringing that about so you'll be ready when high noon comes. So you'll be ready when you're on Mount Carmel, like Elijah is here today. I want you to notice three things. And remember, we're not going to read the whole chapter this morning. I'll walk through the chapter, but I want to remind you the powers and the perfect word of God to, to inform us and to transform us through the work of his Holy Spirit. Number one, I want you to notice in the first 19 verses, it's time to confront. It's time to confront. This is important and interesting to discover the instruction of the word of the Lord. The Bible gives that phrase there in verse 1, after this, after these things, after many days. There's another scene in the life of Elijah. We've turned a page. We've seen what has happened. Now we're going to see what's about to happen. After this, after these days, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And look at what it says there in 1 Kings 18 and verse 1. What does it say? The word of the Lord came to Elijah and it says, go show yourself. Now, I want you to remember something very important. It's important for us to listen to the specific instructions of the Word of God. Because there in chapter 18 and verse 1, he says, go show yourself. If you turn back a page, chapter 17 and verse 3, what was God's instruction to Elijah? Go hide yourself. Now, this is important. Because we don't know God's timing. We don't know his plan. We don't know his purpose. All we know is as we listen to the voice of the Spirit, he gives us instructions. And sometimes those instructions seem like they don't make sense. Which is it, God? Do you want me to hide myself? Or do you want me to show myself? Do you want me to, to go hide in the woods? Or do you want me to be out front and open? But you've got to... Following the will of God is not just about what you do. It's about when to do it. You got to listen to his voice and hear God's specific instruction to Elijah now is no longer hide by a brook, no longer to be hidden, no longer to be obscure, but now to be out in the open. Go show yourself to Ahab. Go show yourself to the king. Now's the time to be ready, to be public because God is about to do something powerful. Can I just tell you this morning, you need to hear this and we all need to remember this. God's timing is everything. God's timing is everything. You can know the task, but if you perform the right task at the wrong time, you are still wrong. You need to learn his timing. The right task at the right time is God's will and God's purpose. I want you to notice a couple of things about this. It's time to confront a desolate land. Letter A, a desolate land. We see this in verses 2 through 6. The Bible tells us here the famine was severe in Samaria. Now, it's easy for us just to kind of brush past those words. But in reality, most of us, if not all of us in this room, have no idea what it's like to live through a famine. Not only a famine, but the Bible says the famine was severe. This was an incredibly severe famine. It was an agricultural economy. They depended on provision from the fields, and the fields depended upon provision from rain. And rain was controlled by Almighty God. And Elijah had said, no rain. Guess how long it had been? Three years with no rain. Imagine the drought that they're experiencing in California times three. This was a severe famine in Samaria. Don't rush over those words. Chuck Swindoll describes it like this. Three years without a drop of rain in the entire land of Israel. Every brook had dried up. Think about the abundance of carcasses and skeletons of animals that had littered the fields. Imagine the stench of death that must have been like. It was a picture of death and disease everywhere you look. In verse 4 to 6, we see that Ahab and one of Ahab's servants, Obadiah, began to go out looking for grass so they could feed their livestock. Look verse 4. We'll read to verse 6. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah, now Obadiah was a righteous man, served the king. Obadiah took a hundred of the prophets and, and hid them by fifties in caves and fed them with bread and water. 
And Obadiah, and, and Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water, to all the valleys, perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and the mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them and passed through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself. Obadiah went in the other direction by himself. Here they are. They are scouring the land to find a place where their cattle can graze because there's no grass. Now think about it. We we live in a place where uh, there's probably more green than anything. Trees and grass and bushes and shrubs. Here, everything had died. But I'm going to tell you, disobedience makes you do dumb things. Because here they are scouring the land for grass instead of repenting and praying for rain. Here they are looking around. I mean, that's what we do when we fail to follow the Lord. What we do is we begin to do things that don't make sense. When we are apart from, out of sync in our relationship with God. When we are not walking with the Lord, we begin to do foolish things. We begin to search for sustenance and support in all sorts of places instead of realizing that our strength and supply comes from Him. Here they are trying to find it all. And... Ahab goes one direction, Obadiah goes to another direction, and this will, this will set up what we see next. So we see a desolate land, we see a divine appointment, a divine appointment. Now the Bible tells us in verses 8 to 15 that Elijah first meets Obadiah. And Elijah and Obadiah know each other, and, and, and Obadiah's like, wow, it's Elijah. Elijah says, go tell the king, here I am. And Obadiah says, I don't want to do that, because if I go tell the king, here you are, you're not going to be there when he comes back, and guess who's going to be in trouble? Obadiah didn't want to get in trouble. Obadiah had been hiding 50 prophets in one cave, 50 prophets in another cave. He'd been providing for them from from Jezebel and from Ahab and from the supply of the kingdom. And he didn't want to get caught. He didn't want to get in trouble. He sees Obadiah first. And then in verse 17 and beyond, Ahab and Elijah meet. Ahab calls him the troubler of Israel. Look at verse 17. Look what the Bible says there, verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, O troubler of Israel? He probably learned, uh, learned his nicknames from his wife Jezebel. You know, here's, here's what the word troubler means. You know what the tr- word troubler means? It means snake. Elijah, here's Elijah and Ahab, and Elijah gets called by the king you snake in the grass. You're the one who's been causing all the problems. You're the one who's been troubling this land. You're the one who's made it not rain for now these three years. And Elijah confronts Ahab in a bold way. Notice he doesn't shrink in the presence of the king. Verse 18, I've not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house. Why? Because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Elijah is not timid. He's not shy. He's not in a corner cowering. He proclaims clearly. I'm not the one who's troubled Israel. You're the one who's troubled Israel. You're the one who's caused it not to rain because you followed after the Baals instead of the Lord. And I just want you to know today, increasingly in our society, we are living in a culture that believes and lives as if the Christians are the one who are troubling the nation. You see a high school football coach who prays with his team and loses his job because he refuses to stop. Christians are now told to go hide in the closet while everything else is celebrated. Listen to me carefully. This world is backwards and mixed up. And believe me, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But once it gets better, it's going to be good. But here we are in a situation where Elijah is the one who's called the troubler, when in reality the trouble lies with this pagan king. And in reality, this is the way we live today too. More and more Christianity is out of the mainstream in our society. And it's pushed to the margins and to the edges. And you and I need to be prepared to stand up and to confront when we need to confront and to speak the truth in love, but in boldness as well. It's interesting in verse 18, if you look at this, very interesting. The king meets the prophet, but who's given the orders? The prophet gives the orders, not the king. But he's a prophet. He's a leader. He's not looking for suggestions. He's not getting together, having a summit, saying, hey, let's talk about this. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. Verse 19, the meeting is set. I'll meet you at high noon. Meet me at Mount Carmel for a showdown. And Elijah lays it out. Yeah, I once heard about a confrontation between a mother and her son. 
her mother and this, this young boy. Mother said to her son, young man, there were two cookies in the pantry this morning. Can I ask you, could you tell me how there's only one cookie now? He said, mom, the only explanation is it was so dark I could only see one. I couldn't see both. I'm going to tell you, when when we walk in darkness, we can get ourselves in trouble. When we walk in darkness and not walk in the light, we can get in trouble. But I want you to know something very important. When we realize the truth, we have to walk in that truth, even if it means it's time to confront. Number two, notice this, it's time to choose. It's time to confront, but it's also time to choose. In verses 20 to 29... We see a showdown is brewing. It's like people are beginning to gather around right there in that western town. You can see them walking up in their cowboy boots and their cowboy hats with their their guns and in their holsters. You can see the marshal there gathering around everybody and a crowd begins to gather. They know something's about to happen. Well, look, it's high noon. Everybody's coming to see the show. Look what the Bible says there in verse 20. Ahab sent to, look at this now, all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together. At Mount Carmel. Here they are. Gathering together. One one commentator. Now a large gathering here. One commentator said it could be as many as 15,000 people. Gathered on the top of a mountain. It's a showdown. There's anticipation in the air. Do You know in the land of Palestine. If it was going to rain. Pretty much it almost always rained first. On the top of Mount Carmel. It was a high place. Moisture collection there caused the rain to drop down there first. Can you feel the anticipation, the expectation something big is about to happen? Elijah had come to Ahab and said, it's going to rain. And here now there's a showdown between the prophets, all these false prophets, and this one true prophet of the Lord. Thousands of people have gathered. Can you imagine the scene as Elijah there stands and watches Ahab and Jezebel and 850 false prophets with all their fanfare and glitter and applause and pomp and circumstance then they walk on in and Elijah walks in with no glitter no glamour no music just the glow of God on his face preparing for a showdown and to experience victory look what the Bible says here in verse 21 Elijah came near to all the people and said listen to this question boy it's a great question for the church today as well listen to verse 21 Elijah came and asked this question How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. That's a great translation in the English Standard Version because literally what the phrase means in the original language is how long are you going to go limping back and forth? It was used to refer to a bird that would jump from limb to limb, just kind of flittering around. Back and forth, back and forth. How long will you act like a crazy little bird flittering around from one side to another saying, I want to serve God. No, I want to serve Baal. No, I want to serve God. No, I want to serve Baal. I want to serve self. And here Elijah calls them out. I mean, you know what the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24? Look at the word of God on your screen. How are we able to serve two masters? No one serves two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other. Or you'll despise the one and be devoted to the other. You can't serve God and money. And the problem is in many churches today, we say we want to serve God with our lips. But we serve everything else with our lives. Here Elijah calls them out. It's time to choose. You have to choose. If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. But no longer can you go back and forth between two ways. This is what frustrated God so much about the Laodicean church. Remember, they weren't hot, they weren't cold, they were lukewarm. And it made God sick. God is saying to you, to me, to his people through this prophet, I will not take second place to an idol in your life. He said, I don't worship any idols. Oh, you do. We all, we all battle with worshiping idols in our life. Listen to what James Packer said. What other gods could we have besides the Lord? Plenty. Consider our gods in our culture today. Sex, shekels, stomach, the unholy trinity constituting the God of self. Other gods like pleasure, possessions, position. Other gods like football, the firm, even our family. The list is endless for anything 
that anyone allows to run his life becomes a god. Anything that anyone allows to run his life becomes a god. That's why the warning and admonition in, in, in 1 John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21. So here in verses 22 to 29, Elijah says, it's time that we demonstrate who the one true God really is. He's setting up something. He's setting up this, this competition here on the top of Mount Carmel. So at the end of the day, it will be absolutely clear. There will be no question who is the true God. He's saying at the end of the day, you will know for certain if the Lord Jehovah is God. Let's walk through this. Verse 25, we'll read 25, 26, 27, 28. Let's walk through this real quick. Look at verse 25. Here's what he says. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. So Elijah wins the coin toss, but defers to the second half. Let's them go first, okay? Elijah says, I'm going to let you guys go first. You've got 850 of you. Pick a bull so you can have your sacrifice, but don't yet light the fire. Verse 26. And they took a bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal. Look at that. From morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered and they limped around the altar that they had made. Now, here they are. For over six hours, they called on their God. What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Verse 27. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing or relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. In other words, Elijah says, if he really is a God, maybe he's just distracted right now. Scream louder. Call louder. Maybe he'll answer you. Elijah's kind of picking on him a little bit. And then notice verse 28. They cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Can I just say this? Aren't you thankful that we don't have to reach out to God that way? Here they are cutting themselves for a false God where our God sent Jesus to bleed on our behalf. There's a sermon right there, folks. I mean, think about it. Here they are reaching out to the false gods, cutting themselves to get his attention. And God loved us so much, he sent his only son to suffer and to bleed and to die. Listen carefully. To come to Jesus, you just have to depend, trust, put your faith in his sacrifice upon the cross. He did all the suffering on our behalf so that we might be saved. Well, all right. That's another sermon for another day. It's time to choose. Their time was up. No touchdown, no field goal. They'd done nothing. Elijah's trying to get him to see. Here, and here's something for us to know. When you make the wrong choice, you get nothing. And to not choose God is the wrong choice. This is what happened. For six hours, they cried out to a false god. Nothing. And Elijah's telling the people now. Remember, these are prophets. And here are the people. The people are watching what's going on. 850 false prophets. And Elijah says to them, stop going back and forth from one position to the next, from one position to the next. You know, when I read that this week, you know what I thought of? I thought of a squirrel that runs out in the middle of the road. You ever seen these squirrels? And here you are, minding your own business, not really wanting to kill anything that day, driving along to work or back home or to school, and, and all of a sudden this squirrel runs out in the middle of the road. And poor little squirrel, if it were to keep running across the road, would make it just fine. Would be able to go live with his squirrel wife and his squirrel family and all those nuts that he stored up for the winter. Some other squirrel's going to get them now. Because what happens? Squirrel gets halfway across, sees my Toyota Tundra coming down the road, and what does it do? Stops just like that. And then it starts to go back to where it just was, but then stops again and goes back and forth until... Thump, thump. <laughs> You've seen it before, right? Literally, that happened to me on Old Perry Road. And I'm not lying. I saw the squirrel doing backflips after I hit it. It just... It doesn't make any sense. And I want to be like, man, I, 
I don't eat squirrel stew, right? Not really interested in squirrel chili or anything like that. Some of you probably have some great squirrel recipes in love. In the name of Jesus, keep them to yourself. I'm not interested, all right? But I began to think about that poor little squirrel that just couldn't make a decision. And then I began to think, we do that so much. And I wonder if God is in heaven saying, I don't know if God would say this, but I'm going to say this. Dummy, pick the right way to go and go that way. But here you are running back and forth between the word and the world, between Jesus and the world, between sin, between righteousness. And what happens? We get flattened in the middle of the road. We do. And we suffer because we're not able to choose. And Elijah says, stop Stop limping around like a little bird on the branches. Stop acting like the crazy squirrel that has no sense. You need to make a choice, and the choice is clear. We've got to choose life. Choose Christ. Number three, I want you to notice, it's time to confess. It's time to confront. It's time to choose. It's time to confess. We see this in the last section, verse 30 to verse 40, here in chapter 18. Here in verses 30 to 40, the the prophets of Baal have had their time, nothing. Now Elijah comes and he steps up to the plate. And this is where the fire fell, right? This, This is the climax of the story. This is where God answers and God speaks miraculously and powerfully. First, he repairs the broken altar. He's very open about what he's doing. If you'll notice in verse 30, I circled these words. Elijah said to all the people, here's the words I circled, come near to me. Why does he say come near? He wants them to know there's no funny business here. This isn't a magic show. I'm not hiding something. I want you to see plainly what I'm doing. You see, the prophets of Baal were notorious for hiding a spark or a flame up underneath their altar. They were notorious for being deceivers. They also had underground chambers that contained fire. They were false prophets leading a false life, pointing to a false God. Elijah says, come look. I want you to see I've not done anything. And then beyond that, what happened? Elijah tells him, take four barrels of water and drown the sacrifice three times. Now I'm not a boy scout, never was in the boy scouts. But I do believe I know if you drench where you want to start a fire with buckets and buckets of water, it's going to be difficult to start a fire. That's right for those of you who are ever in Boy Scouts, I'm pretty sure, right? So Elijah says, take four buckets, pour them out, do it again, do it again. So time after time, buckets are being poured out. And here's what Elijah's doing. He wants it to be clear at the end of the day that this is not about a prophet. This is not about Elijah. That this is not just about a mountain. That this is about a God. The one true God who lives, who reigns, who works miracles. Look at what it says here in verse 36 and verse 37. At the time of the offering, the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, listen to his prayer now. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me. Why? That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Why does Elijah want God to act? Not so Elijah can have a New York Times bestseller. Not so he can expand his ministry to satellite and television and radio. Why does Elijah want God to work? So that God will be seen as who he is. So they will know that you are the one true God. That's why Elijah wants God to act. And then he was praying to the only one who could do anything about his situation. I believe this was Elijah's full prayer. The prophets of Baal prayed for six hours. He prayed for less than 60 seconds. By the way, sometimes it's not necessarily about how long you pray. It's about the passion in your heart. Sometimes what I've noticed is people want to sound spiritual who haven't prayed in quite a while want to catch up when they're in public. Charles Spurgeon used to say, pray one minute, I'll pray with you. Pray two minutes, I'll pray for you. Pray three minutes, I'll pray against you. Especially Baptist, if it's time to eat, thank the Lord for the food and get to the grub. You know what I'm talking about? Tell you what, anyway, 
Here he prayed about 60 seconds. God, I want him to know that you are the Lord. Look what the Bible says in verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Folks, I want you to know this is not an Old Testament fairy tale. This is a God who works miraculously and answered the prayer of his prophet through fire. The same God that moves and works in our lives in our world today. You want to know something interesting? Baal had a nickname. Baal was known as the God of fire. Did you know that? Baal, the God of fire, couldn't even start a spark. But Jehovah God sends flames from heaven. God isn't just starting a campfire. He is making a statement. You might think that Baal is God, but let me show you something. God is real. I'm telling you, folks, it's time to confess. It's time to confess that God is God. Now, now read verse 40. This is interesting. Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. They seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and they slaughtered them there. Good guys win. Bad guys die. You may think, now that's... That's pretty extreme. Listen listen to what Chuck Swindoll says. You say, what an extreme response it is. Is it? Would you think a physician who found a mass of rapidly growing malignant cells in your abdomen and said, I think it's best that we remove these cells or I'd like to do minor surgery. What would you want? A good doctor would say, we must get rid of all these deadly cells or the surrounding areas that it may have contaminated. The prophets of Baal were immoral, hostile, anti-God, and they were a malignancy in Israel. It's a picture of how you and I are supposed to deal with sin. We don't deal with sin slightly. We eradicate it completely. Confession is good for the soul. Have you heard that before? It's time to confess. Many years ago, I heard about four pastors who got together for a little friendly gathering. And they began to have a conversation. And they said, you know, we're always doing these counseling appointments. And and our church folks will come to us. And and they'll confess sin. Or they'll talk about their difficulties. And and one of the pastors said, I think it would be great for for the four of us to come together. This was many years ago. Four of us come together. And we'll confess our sin. And we'll try to to help each other. Confession is, is good for the soul. Finally, all four of them agreed. One confessed, well, I'll tell you what, sometimes I'll sneak out of the office and I'll, I, I like to go to the movies. And so I'll go watch a movie from time to time and my church people don't know. The second said, well, you know, the reality is I like to, I like to smoke cigars. And the third one said, I like to go play cards from time to time. This was many years ago. And when it came to the fourth one, they wouldn't get him to confess. The others pressed him and said, come on, we confessed our sins. We told you what our problem is. What's your secret? What's your vice? He said, mine's gossiping and I can hardly wait to get out of here. (laughs) Confession is good for the soul, right? I want you to know that's that's not the kind of confession we're talking about. It's time to confess. Not to confess to me, but to confess to God. Can I be honest with you? Far too often we jump from limb to limb, back and forth, or like the squirrel in the middle of the road. We can't make up our mind. Listen carefully. If God is God... Serve him. If he's not, then what in the world are you doing here? If God is God, he deserves 100%. He is God. It's high noon, folks. Here we are gathered around. And we've been called out. Satan is gunning for your soul. Jesus offers salvation. It's time to choose. It's time to confess. Christ is Lord.